uh, where the eyes deviated so far to the side, then oftentimes surgical procedures is going to be the best bet. Uh, and it actually is really helpful, uh, not just for the vision correction, but even just for cosmetic reasons, because they they have found that you know people who do have an eye that's turning the wrong way. How does I, it's just making me think of that because you're talking about like the motion of the eyes, but how does like a lazy eye happen? Mm. Are you, is that always something you're born with or can you develop that as well? So it oftentimes is something that uh, kids are just born with, you know, mm. um, that's the way kind of God made them. Sometimes it's, uh, it's sec sometimes it is secondary to the fact that they have an uncorrected need for things like glasses. Mm. So for an example, it actually happens quite frequently. Little kids will be born f really farsighted. So no, most kids are born slightly farsighted, like four or five diopters. Uh, and then as they go through the first few years of life, that, that plus power, their, their eyes are really small, the eyes go through emetropinization. So the eye actually gets a little bit longer and they get closer to hitting zero, mm. not needing glasses. And that's a normal process. But some kids are born so farsighted that they learn as a young kid that they can just flex their eye muscles really strong and they can power through that farsightedness. But the problem is that when you use the muscle inside the eye, it is neurologically tethered to the muscles on the outside of the eye to turn inward. And so, for anybody who's watching on, on the cameras, like when you try to focus up close, your eyes, again, both turn inward. So mm. what happens is that these little kids, they end up turning their eyes like this, and then they just prioritize one eye because the brain wants doesn't want to exert more energy than it needs to. So, right. So one eye turns in all the way, the other eye's looking straight ahead. And so it looks like, oh, well, the eye's lazy, it's turning in. Well, actually, they just need glasses and as soon as you give them glasses and they don't need to use those muscles boom, they go straight again. so they don't the body doesn't adjust to that and train it permanently unfortunately to be that way yeah thankfully in that case but the problem is that if they're left like that for too long as a young yeah. kid then the eye that's turned in their brain learns to mute it and ignore mm. it and then that part of the brain starts to develop what we call amblyopia because it's not using it. Right. So then it never develops as strong of a, an appreciation to see like 20-20 vision. Can glasses like, when, if you have that and it does develop like a mm -hmm. long-term ability where you're actually, one eye is in and the other eye is out, can sure. glasses also be prescribed to change how that looks? Sometimes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I got one friend, he's got like one eye hunting, one eye fish, and he throws on glasses and he looks straight as an yep. arrow. So thankfully there are, there are some times when that does work with prism glasses, or again, some forms of uh, vision therapy can be prescribed to help get things back into alignment and coordination improves. Mm. But if it's a really large angle. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. Uh, where the eyes deviated so far to the side, then oftentimes surgical procedures is going to be the best bet. Uh, and it actually is really helpful, uh, not just for the vision correction, but even just for cosmetic reasons. Because they, they have found that you know people who do have an eye that's turning the wrong way, we, we don't mean to like give this judgment to them, but people do automatically sort of judge them and assume that they're stupid or that there's something wrong with them, or they're not as attractive. Mm. Uh, and so they, those individuals are less likely to get hired for jobs. They're less likely to That's get true. into college. They're less likely, they, um, and it's, so there is a cosmetic benefit, uh, not just a cosmetic benefit, but like, I would say almost a psychological lifestyle benefit to having that procedure. Absolutely, and, and like, it, it, it's a shame that like, that's a reality, but as humans, we are wired for symmetry. Mm -hmm. in everything so when you see something that's like asymmetrical there's a there's like a evolutionary function that says like oh that's wrong yeah or something it's got nothing to do with someone's neurological ability obviously right. but you know there's like just that like prejudicial judgment that does come in for sure yeah and so um there i know a lot of other doctors who when they see a, a kid who you know it's like oh well, the vision's not going to improve with the surgery but 
it's like, we should just get this done now when they're 10 or 12, because it's going to open them so many more doors sure. in life. And it's going to, it's going to help them suffer, uh, avoid suffering from other just kind of lifestyle, you know, f making friends, um, again, those sort of opportunities. Yeah. Even like with you, you didn't have the physical aspect of it, but like <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't see that well. And then yeah. suddenly you're able to see with your glasses, you can play sports now mm -hmm. while the contact lenses yeah. made you able to play football. And then like, your whole life you start girls start talking to you your whole life improves i mean for a 13 14 year old that's a big deal yeah during those years to be able to kind of be given that second lease you know what i mean mm -hmm. and and especially for school uh you know academic performance is enhanced so much more so that's why some states here in the u.s like it's it's like you have to see an eye doctor before you go into kindergarten mm. because uh, kids who are being missed by school screenings and other things because kids aren't going to be like hey i can't see they, that's all they know. They've they've known it their whole life, so they don't know what good vision mm, is. Yeah. So uh, I think it's really important for parents to just be aware of that you know you can't wait for your kids to speak up and say they can't see something. They for have sure. to. You have to bring them in, even if they're not complaining, just to make sure the eyes are healthy, that we're not missing anything, and that we potentially catch diseases and things like that early. Yeah. Uh, especially now because there's a lot of interest on myopia, um, which is nearsightedness, because. Myopia, we used to think of it as, oh, just your vision's getting worse, you need stronger glasses. That was all it was. But with myopia, the eyes are actually growing longer. So it's not just that your eye needs stronger glasses, it's that the eyeball itself has extended backwards toward the brain by about one millimeter for every three diopters. And mm. so for myself, I was almost six diopters. So my eye is essentially two millimeters longer than somebody who doesn't require any form of correction. Now, it doesn't sound like, oh, what's two millimeters? But that two millimeters oh, yeah. is the stretching of the tissue. And that extra strain and stretch increases your risk for cataracts, it increases your risk for glaucoma, increases your risk for um, retinal detachments, where the retina just pulls off the back of the eye, <clears throat> uh, all potentially vision loss blinding conditions, and then uh, dramatically increases your risk for what's called myopic maculopathy, which is basically the retina in the back of the eye starts to do degenerate. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> because of all these reasons, that's why it's we've taken a lot of extra steps to figure out, okay, lifestyle-wise and, and, and treatment-wise, what can we do to slow down these kids from becoming so nearsighted? Mm. Because if we can slow down the nearsightedness and reduce their risk of having all these diseases, not only do we prevent vision loss and blindness over their lifetime, but we decrease um, like the expense and all of the other kind of negative effects that come with it. For sure. Uh, and here in the US, um, children, about 40% of kids are nearsighted now. It used to only be about 20%. Is that? So yeah, we're gonna get in. So this yeah. is, I think, is a great trajectory into phones and things like that. Uh, but part of it is kids spending a lot more time indoors. So it's not just, oh, I'm on the screen, uh, but it's doing near activities in general. So obviously kids, way before phones came out, kids were becoming more and more nearsighted mm -hmm. at stronger amounts. And that's because of reading and the amount of times we spend indoors. We're not outside playing soccer and, and hanging out in the field. field like that. Right. Yeah, we're yeah. not we're not like how we used to develop as as human beings. We spend a lot more time indoors. Uh, we're in our comfort zone with all the air conditioning and heating. And so part of it's being indoors, part of it's reading and just doing near activities, uh, which includes a lot of time on phones. Um, and there's some other factors that haven't been fully identified. Certainly genetics plays a role too. Um, but as kids spend more time indoors and they have the genetics for it, they are more likely to have a faster rate of this eyeball expanding um, and basically growing longer. Mm. And so now we measure for axial length. A lot of times in many clinics, they have devices to measure how long it is and then even predict using AI based on family genetics, time spent indoors, academic stressors, how nearsighted they likely could be by the time their eye stops growing. But now we have devices. We either have um, prescription glasses now that were just FDA approved. They've actually been available in other countries like Canada for like five, six years uh, that can slow down nearsightedness development. Oh, wow. So it can actually stop the, whoa. Yeah, it can slow it down by about 50% if the kids wear it nonstop for 12 hours a day. 
there's other ones where contact lenses, both soft lenses and hard lenses, which I think are genius, um, called orthokeratology. So most contact lenses, people are told don't sleep in them, right? Because your chance for infection goes up dramatically if you sleep in contact lenses. But there's a contact lens that's specifically designed for kids or anybody, even adults, to sleep in them. Mm. And when you're sleeping in them, it's kind of like wearing braces for your teeth. Yeah. It changes and molds the shape of the eye so that when you wake up the next morning, you can see 20-20. And wow. you take out the contacts and you don't wear them during the day and you can still see 20-20. And then that night you put them back in and then you just it keeps remolding and holding the shape of the eye. And so that's an alternative to LASIK for people who maybe aren't candidates for LASIK, but they find that that, that process also slows down the rate of nearsightedness development. Mm. And so that's sometimes used, there's eye drops like atropine eye drops that are used. Um, they're not FDA approved yet, uh, but that's been going on, un undergoing a lot of research. So some doctors prescribe it off label. Um, and then there's even some investigations into red light therapy in Asia uh, that that may be a way to slow down myopia too. Wait, so how are they using red light to do that? Yeah, so uh, there's different forms of red light therapies. This one specifically is called repeated low level light red light therapy. And so they use a specific wavelength, around 650 nanometers of light, that's the current device that's being tested. And they do it for three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the afternoon, five days a week. Eyes open, like eyes open. It's actually more shining. like it's like a tabletop device, and it's a it's like looking into a laser pointer. Yeah, that's it's, what I'm thinking. And so uh, they have shown in several studies, and this is all again happening in East Asia because the the rate of myopia development in East Asia is like ninety percent of the population. Again, here in the U.S., it's like forty percent and steadily increasing. They expect it to be fifty percent of the world population by twenty fifty. Yeah, but. In, again, in East Asia, it's like 90%. Fucking WeChat, man. <laughs> uh, but they find that the kids who are treated in this, and they, they've been doing these studies for like a year long. The kids who are on it have a reduced risk of myopia advancement. And even kids who don't have nearsightedness yet, it prevents some kids from developing nearsightedness. But that's, not da that's also not damaging their eyes in other ways? So that's the, the caveat right mm. now. And that's why even the, especially here in the US, they're like backing up from it because there are... Sadly, case reports where kids have had reduced vision and yeah. damage, uh, loss of cones, uh, the cone cell density inside the back of the eye has diminished. And then um, they've even been proven that some of these devices simply are breaching the safety levels that they're supposed to be safeguarding against. Yeah, uh, Enough so that uh, China actually changed their laser category for these devices from a class two to a class three. What, is, what does that mean? Uh, it's just a safety category okay. uh, of like exposure to the light density, to like how powerful it is. Um, so there needs to be a lot more research on those devices before yeah. anybody, before I recommend anybody have their kids stare at red light. But that could be a part of the equation that we do know that kids who spend more time outdoors are less likely to develop nearsightedness. So we have to question, is it because they're just not indoors and they're not having that stimulus of like focus and you're in an indoor environment? Or is it because they are getting more vitamin D from the sun? Or is it because they are getting red and near infrared light from being outdoors too? Well, I mean, not to be Captain Obvious here, but what if it's just a combination of all of it? You know it what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> right? You got it on the, that. that's really what it is. We know it's the combination of all those things. So they- Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.